It is the endeavor of this treatise to convey spiritual scientific knowledge concerning the being of man. The method of representation is arranged in such a way that the reader may grow into what is depicted so that in the course of reading it becomes for him a kind of self-conference. If this soliloquy takes on such a form that thereby hitherto concealed forces which can be awakened in every soul reveal themselves, then the reading leads to a real inner work of the soul, and the latter can see itself gradually urged on to that soul journeying, which truly advances towards the beholding of the spiritual world. What has to be imparted, therefore, has been given in the form of eight meditations, which can be actually practiced. If this is done, they can be adapted for imparting to the soul through its own inner deepening that about which they speak. It has been my aim on the one hand to give something to those readers who have already made themselves conversant with the literature dealing with the domain of the supersensible, as it is here understood. Thus, through the style of the description, through the communication directly connecting with the soul's experience, perhaps those who have knowledge of supersensible life will here find something that may appear of importance to them. On the other hand, many a one can find that just through this method of representation, Profit may be gained by those who yet stand far distant from the achievements of spiritual science. Although this work is intended as an amplification of my other writings in the domain of spiritual science, it should nevertheless be possible to read it independently. It has been my endeavor in my books, Theosophy and Occult Science, to represent the things as they show themselves to observation when it ascends to the spiritual. In these works, the method of representation is descriptive, and its direction prescribed by conformity to the law manifesting out of the things themselves. In this, a road to self-knowledge, the method of representation is different. Herein is stated that which can be experienced by a soul which sets out on the path to the spirit in a certain manner. The treatise may therefore be regarded as an account of experiences of the soul. Only it must be taken into consideration that the experiences which can be gained in such a way as is here described must assume an individual form in each soul according to its own peculiarity. It has been my endeavor to do justice to this fact, so that one can also imagine that what is depicted here has been actually lived through by an individual soul, exactly as represented. The title of this treatise is therefore A Road to Self-Knowledge. On that account it may serve the purpose of assisting other souls to live into this portrayal and attain corresponding goals and is an amplification of my book Knowledge of the Higher Worlds and its attainment. Only isolated fundamental experiences of a spiritual scientific nature are represented. The giving of information in this manner of the further spheres of spiritual science is suspended for the present. Rudolf Steiner, Munich, August 1912First meditation, in which the attempt is made to obtain a true idea of the physical body. When the soul is surrendered to the phenomena of the outer world by means of physical perception, it cannot be said, after true self-analysis, that the soul perceives these phenomena, or that it actually experiences the things of the outer world. For during the time of surrender, in its devotion to the outer world, the soul knows in truth nothing of itself. 
The fact is rather that the sunlight itself radiating from things through space in various colors lives or experiences itself within the soul. When the soul enjoys any event, at the moment of enjoyment, it actually is joy insofar as it is conscious of being anything. Joy experiences itself in the soul. The soul is one with its experience of the world. It does not experience itself as something separate, which feels joy, admiration, delight, satisfaction, or fear. It actually is joy, admiration, delight, satisfaction, and fear. If the soul would always admit this fact, then and only then would the occasions when it retires from the experience of the outer world and contemplates itself by itself appear in the right light. These moments would then appear as forming a life of quite a special character, which at once shows itself to be entirely different from the ordinary life of the soul. It is with this special kind of life that the riddles of the soul's existence begin to dawn upon our consciousness. And these riddles are, in fact, the source of all other riddles of the world, for two worlds, an outer and an inner, present themselves to the spirit of man. Directly the soul for a longer or shorter time ceases to be one with the outer world and withdraws into the loneliness of its own existence. Now, this withdrawal is no simple process, which, having been once accomplished, may be repeated again in much the same way. It is much more like the beginning of a pilgrimage into worlds previously unknown. When once this pilgrimage has been begun, every step made will call forth others, and will also be the preparation for these others. It is the first step which makes the soul capable of taking the next one, and each step brings fuller knowledge of the answer to the question, what is man in the true sense of the word? Worlds open up, which are hidden from the ordinary conception of life, and yet only in those worlds can the facts be found which will reveal the truth about this very conception. And even if no answer proves all-embracing and final, the answers obtained through the soul's inner pilgrimage go beyond everything which the outer senses and the intellect bound up with them can ever give. For this something more is necessary to man, and he will find that this is so when he really and earnestly analyzes his own nature. At the outset of such a pilgrimage through the realm of our own soul, hard logic and common sense are necessary. They form a safe starting point for pushing on into the supersensible realms, which the soul, after all, is yearning to reach. Many a soul would prefer not to trouble about such a starting point, but rather penetrate directly into the supersensible realms, though every healthy soul even if it has at first avoided such common sense considerations as disagreeable, will always submit to them later. For however much knowledge of the supersensible worlds one may have obtained from another starting point, one can only gain a firm footing there through some such methods of reasoning as follow here. In the life of the soul, moments may come in which it says to itself, you must be able to withdraw from everything that an outer world can give you if you do not wish to be forced into confessing that you are but self-contradictory nonsense. But this would make life impossible, because it is clear that what you perceive around you exists independently of you. It existed without you and will continue to exist without you. Why then do colors perceive themselves in you? whilst your perception may be of no consequence to them? Why do the forces and materials of the outer world build up your body? Careful thought will show that this body 
only acquires life as the outward manifestation of you. It is a part of the outer world transformed into you, and moreover, you realize that it is necessary to you. Because, to begin with, you could have no inner experiences without your senses, which the body alone can put at your disposal. You would remain empty without your body, such as you are at the beginning. It gives you through the senses inner fullness and substance. And then all those reflections may follow which are essential to any human existence if it does not wish to get into unbearable contradiction with itself at certain moments which come to every human being. This body as it exists at the present moment is the expression of the soul's experience. Its processes are such as to allow the soul to live through it and to gain experience of itself in it. A time will come, however, when this will not be so. The life in the body will someday be subject to laws quite different from those which it obeys today whilst living for you and for the sake of your soul's experience. It will become subject to those laws according to which the material and forces in nature are acting. Laws which have nothing more to do with you and your life. The body to which you owe the experience of your soul will be absorbed in the general world process and exist there in a form which has nothing more in common with anything that you experience within yourself. Such a reflection may call forth in the inner experience all the horror of the thought of death, but without the admixture of the merely personal feelings which are ordinarily connected with this thought. When such personal feelings prevail, it is not easy to establish the calm, deliberate state of mind necessary for obtaining knowledge. It is natural that man should want to know about death and about a life of the soul independent of the dissolution of the body. But the relation existing between man himself and these questions is, perhaps, more than anything else in the world, apt to confuse his objective judgment and to make him accept as genuine answers only those which are inspired by his own desires or wishes. For it is impossible to obtain true knowledge of anything in the spiritual realms without being able with complete unconcern to accept a no quite as willingly as a yes. And we need only look conscientiously into ourselves to become distinctly aware of the fact that we do not accept the knowledge of an extinction of the life of the soul together with the death of the body with the same equanimity as the opposite knowledge which teaches the continued existence of the soul beyond death. No doubt there are people who quite honestly believe in the annihilation of the soul on the extinction of the life of the body, and who arrange their lives accordingly. But even these are not unbiased with regard to such a belief. It is true that they do not allow the fear of annihilation and the wish for continued existence to get the better of the reasons which are distinctly in favor of such annihilation. So far, the conception of these people is more logical than that of others who unconsciously construct or accept arguments in favor of a continued existence because there is an ardent desire in the secret depths of their souls for such continued existence. And yet the view of those who deny immortality is no less biased, only in a different way. There are amongst them some who build up a certain idea of what life and existence are. This idea forces them to think of certain conditions, without which life is impossible. Their view of existence leads them to the conclusion that the conditions of the soul's life can no longer be present when the body falls away. 
Such people do not notice that they have themselves from the very first fixed an idea of the conditions necessary for the existence of life, and cannot believe in a continuation of life after death for the simple reason that according to their own preconceived idea, there is no possibility of imagining an existence without a body. Even if they are not biased by their own wishes, they are biased by their own ideas from which they cannot emancipate themselves. Much confusion still prevails in such matters, and only a few examples need be put forward of what exists in this direction. For instance, the thought that the body, through whose processes the soul manifests its life, will eventually be given over to the outer world, and follow laws which have no relation to inner life, this thought puts the experience of death before the soul in such a way that no wish, no personal consideration, need necessarily enter the mind. And by a thought such as this, we are led to a simple, impersonal question of knowledge. Then also the thought will soon dawn upon the mind that the idea of death is not important in itself, but rather because it may throw light upon life. And we shall have to come to the conclusion that it is possible to understand the riddle of life through the nature of death. The fact that the soul desires its own continued existence should, under all circumstances, make us suspicious with regard to any opinion which the soul forms about its own immortality. For why should the facts of the world pay any heed to the feelings of the soul? It is a possible thought that the soul, like a flame produced from fuel, merely flashes forth from the substance of the body and is then again extinguished. Indeed, the necessity of forming some opinion about its own nature might perhaps lead the soul to this very thought with the result that it would feel itself to be devoid of meaning. But nevertheless, this thought might be the actual truth of the matter, even although it made the soul feel itself to be meaningless. When the soul turns its eyes to the body, it ought only to take into consideration that which the body may reveal to it. It then seems as if in nature such laws were active as drive matter and forces into a continual process of change, and as if these laws controlled the body and after a while drew it into that general process of mutual change. You may put this idea in any way you like, it may be scientifically admissible, but with regard to true reality it proves itself to be quite impossible. You may find it to be the only idea which seems scientifically clear and sensible, and that all the rest are only subjective beliefs. You may imagine that it is so, but you cannot adhere to this idea with a really unbiased mind. And that is the point. Not that which the soul, according to its own nature, feels to be a necessity, but only that which the outer world to which the body belongs makes evident ought to be taken into consideration. After death, this outer world absorbs the matter and forces of the body, which then follow laws that are quite indifferent to that which take place in the body during life. These laws, which are of a physical and chemical nature, have just the same relation to the body as they have to any other lifeless thing of the outer world. It is impossible to imagine that this indifference of the outer world with regard to the human body should only begin at the moment of death and should not have existed during life. An idea of the relation between our body and the physical world cannot be obtained from life, but only from impressing upon our mind the thought that everything belonging to us as a vehicle of our senses, and as the means by which the soul carries on its life, 
All this is treated by the physical world in a way which only becomes clear to us when we look beyond the limits of our bodily life and take into consideration that a time will come when we no longer have about us the body in which we are now gaining experience of ourselves. Any other conception of the relation between the outer physical world and the body conveys in itself the feeling of not conforming with reality. The idea, however, that it is only after death that the real relationship between the body and the outer world reveals itself does not contradict any real experience of the outer or the inner world. The soul does not feel the thought to be unendurable, that the matter and the forces of its body are given up to the processes of the outer world which have nothing to do with its own life. Surrendering itself to life in a perfectly unprejudiced way, it cannot discover in its own depths any wish arising from the body which makes the thought of dissolution after death a disagreeable one. The idea becomes unbearable only when it implies that the matter and the forces returning to the outer world take with them the soul and its experiences of its own existence. Such an idea would be unbearable for the same reason as would any other idea which does not grow naturally out of reliance on the manifestation of the outer world. To ascribe to the outer world an entirely different relation to the existence of the body during life from that which it bears after death is an absolutely futile idea. As such, it will always be repelled by reality, whereas the idea that the relation between the outer world and the body remains the same before and after death is quite sound. The soul holding this latter view feels itself in perfect harmony with the evidence of facts. It is able to feel that this idea does not clash with facts which speak for themselves and to which no artificial thought need be added. One does not always observe in what beautiful harmony are the natural healthy feelings of the soul with the manifestations of nature. This may seem so self-evident as not to need any remark, and yet this seemingly insignificant fact is most illuminating. The idea that the body is dissolved into the elements has nothing unbearable in it, but on the other hand the thought that the soul shares the fate of the body is senseless. There are many human personal reasons which prove this, but such reasons must be left out of consideration in objective investigation. Apart from these reasons, however, thoroughly impersonal attention to the teachings of the outer world shows that no different influence upon the soul can be ascribed to this outer world before death from that which it has after death. The fact is conclusive that this idea presents itself as a necessity and holds its own, against all objections which may be raised against it. Anyone who thinks this thought when fully self-conscious feels its direct truth. In fact, both those who deny and those who believe in immortality think in this way. The former will probably say that the conditions of the bodily processes during life are involved in the laws which act upon the body after death, but they are mistaken if they believe that they are really capable of imagining these laws to be in a different relation to the body during life when it is the vehicle of the soul from that which prevails after death. The only idea possible in itself is that the special combination of forces which comes into existence with the body remains quite as indifferent to the body in its character of a vehicle for the soul as that combination of forces which produces the processes in the dead body. This indifference is not existent on the part of the soul, but on the part of the matter and the forces of the body. The soul gains experience of itself by means of the body, but the body lives with, in and through the outer world and does not allow 
any more importance to the soul as such than to the processes of the outer world. One comes to the conclusion that the heat and cold of the outer world have an influence upon the circulation of the blood in our body, which is analogous to that of fear and shame which exist within the soul. So, first of all, we feel within ourselves the laws of the outer world active in that special combination of materials which manifests itself as the form of the human body. We feel this body as a member of the outer world, but remain ignorant of its inner workings. External science of the present day gives some information as to how the laws of the outer world combine within that particular entity which presents itself as the human body. We may hope that this information will grow more complete in the future, but such increasing information can make no difference whatever to the way in which the soul has to think of its relation to the body. It will, on the contrary, bring more and more into evidence that the laws of the outer world remain in the same relation to the soul before and after death. It is an illusion to expect that the progress of the knowledge of nature will show how far the bodily processes are agents of the life of the soul. We shall more and more clearly recognize that which takes place in the body during life, but the processes in question will always be felt by the soul as being outside it in the same way as the processes in the body after death. The body must therefore appear within the outer world as a combination of forces and substances, which exists by itself and is explainable by itself as a member of this outer world. Nature causes a plant to grow and again decomposes it. Nature rules the human body and causes it to pass away within her own sphere. If man takes up his position to nature with such ideas, he is able to forget himself and all that is in him and feel his body as a member of the outer world. If he thinks in such a way of its relation to himself and to nature, he experiences in connection with himself that which we may call his physical body.